Okay, so in, uh, in the last lesson on the Old Testament, we, um, we discussed um, the introduction to the Old Testament, and today we're going to uh, talk about an introduction to the, uh, to the Bible itself. I hope that you uh, enjoyed the um, the last the last lesson. Um, so really, what we find in the Bible is the root uh, the root of the whole deal is God's covenant. Uh, a lot of times we see a huge drift between the Old Testament and the New Testament, and a lot of times that's because our lack of understanding how the Old Testament applies to us. So the New Testament is a lot easier, and a lot of the authors in the New Testament do the application for us. They draw it out for us. But it's interesting to know that they are still using the Old Testament. In fact, the Old Testament was considered to be, that was their Bible, the early church's Bible. Um, so that, that, I mean, that's obviously increasingly important whenever we're studying the Old Testament, that we understand that, you know, just because uh, we're under a new covenant with God does not mean that... Um, that, you know, the old one has no benefit to us. Um, I, I definitely don't think Paul thought of it like that. So the, the root of both the Old Testament books and the New Testament books, it's God's covenant. God um, doing things to bring humanity back into uh, covenant with himself, back into relationship with himself. Um, another thing that we see throughout the Bible is that faith really does matter. Uh, because of Abraham's faith, there was a covenant um, given to all of what would become Israel, and then eventually to the body, the body of Christ now. Um, uh, and and also um, the the actions of Rahab, the actions of of Ruth, the actions of David, um, caused Jesus to be to come from them, the the offspring of Jesus to come from them. You know, if Rahab, um, the prostitute from Joshua, uh, had not acted in fear to the Lord, um, you know, she wouldn't have been a part of that family tree. God would have been doing something that she would have been um, exempt from. She wouldn't have. She wouldn't have been a part of. Um, if Ruth, who was a Moabite, um, Moabitess, actually, uh, if she wouldn't have acted in, in, in faithfulness to her mother, to her mother-in-law, um, you know. It's questionable as to it's not questionable. She wouldn't have been part of of, David, of Jesus's family line if David had not established the the um, the country under God. Um, you know, very much a part of that. Uh, you know, I think you see where I'm going with this. Salvation was offered to the many because of the faith of the few. And um, so I don't want to overplay. You know, obviously it is God who uses, but there is still that that. that the people who who, who did who did um, respond and remember the Bible is a book full of extremes. Okay, King David, he's not just um, a good person. He's a he's a man after God's own heart. King Saul, who 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 was rejected, he wasn't just tall. He was a foot taller than everybody else. He wasn't just handsome. He was really handsome. You know, uh, Job. He wasn't just a righteous person. He was a very righteous person. So all throughout the Bible, you had these extremes to show us examples. You know, um, the most wise person in the entire world, King Solomon, um, did these dumb things and fell into despair. So why should we do them and expect any different results when we're definitely not the smartest people in the world? Um, so <clears throat> uh, there is there is a few things worth noting about uh, pagan culture. I guess it would be pop culture of their time, I guess. Um, and, and that's first off that the Bible does very strongly contrast with these different books. Oftentimes we fail to see how the Old Testament um, fits um, because we fail to see how the what's being was being written and believed at the same time, uh, you know, in the culture around. Uh, but then also that the Bible does itself use um, a lot of a lot of pop culture with with the way it's formatted with. Like, I think I was reading in the book of Jude, for instance, and he quotes somebody that's not even seen as part of the Old Testament. Um, I can't quite remember the details, but, um, you know, he, he quotes something that, you know, that isn't even 
isn't even part of the Bible. Um, with the wisdom literature, we see you know the formats and, and a lot of different stuff like that. It basically copied um, from from pop culture, and, and you know the Bible isn't the first of its kind. There are a lot of other books um, like that, um, or I, I speak of the books as in the individual parts, like Genesis, for instance. There are a lot of different you know beliefs and stuff that there were a lot similar to it that predated it. Um, the law codes, for instance, had been out for a long time before the book of Leviticus had ever been given to Moses. Um, so um, I'm not really going to touch about Ugaritic parallels, but um, basically all that it comes down to is that in the ancient Near East, there's, there were a lot of different um, different writings that strongly um, contrast and, and compare very well, well to the Old Testament. And as a result, it helps us in, uh, in translating and it helps us um, to figure out you know how to understand something what was meant by something that kind of stuff um, but it is important to note that when they quote pop culture they do it to proclaim God's message they do it to proclaim what what God wants to be said about it rather than simply um, quoting it willy-nilly you know um, also um, the heathen aspects of whatever they're quoting is removed to reaffirm whatever it is that they're they're trying to um, emphasize um, and also it's important to note that the author usually does it to relate to his audience um, gives us something to hey you know about this so now let's use it to emphasize about God uh, Paul does this in the book of Acts when he's in uh, I forget which city I want to say Corinth but I'm not positive about that. Um, anyway, he's in one of the cities, and uh, they have this this shrine, I guess you could say, to the unknown god. And he says, "Hey, this is this is the the actual god that you need to be, you know, um, worshiping or whatever." Uh, point being um, that he used what was familiar to them to reel them into the message of salvation. Um, so. Um, so let's talk about inspiration. Um, the other books that are not part of the canon, I remember, if you remember from last lesson, um, canon is just simply the measuring stick, you know. Um, what is the measuring stick of, of what is inspired and whatnot? Um, the other books that are not included in the canon carry strange doctrine, first off, doctrine that does not mesh with the rest of Scripture. Um, and these books were never seen as Scripture... Um, they were seen maybe sometimes different books were called, were considered church books by all means, but they were not considered to be scripture, to be divine in origin. Um, and so it is important to note that difference. Um, anyways, um, so what what a lot of evangelicals believe um, is is the t is the view that I that I personally uphold, and it's called the plenary verbal um, view of ins inspiration. This is it summated here. All scripture is inspired by God who guided facts and doctrine and the words exactly reflect God's purpose. Um, I don't remember where I got that from. Um, I might have gotten it from um, the textbook for this course, Encountering the Old Testament. I'm not positive about that. Um, so that means um, yeah, I'm, I'm licensed with the Assemblies of God, so these terms are, are familiar with, with those of you who are also a part of the AG. We believe that the Bible is infallible and inerrant. There are no mistakes or errors. Um, yeah. So, uh, just a, a, a quick little uh, introduction about inspiration. Um, but with that, people always go to extremes, so let me kind of clarify this before we get going. Uh, personalities are preserved. In the writings, the personalities are always preserved. You can very much tell that you're reading uh, one of Paul's books um, if you're reading it from the Greek. Um, it translates over to English, yes, but not as strongly as if you read it in the original text. And as a result of that, sometimes because of their personalities being preserved, their point of views are preserved, even if it's not God's point of view. Okay? Now... Let me give you an example of this. Um, the Bible says, for instance, that the uh, that the sun stood still. Well, we know that the sun didn't really stand still. The earth stood still. Because you remember the earth is the one moving around the sun. Um, so with that being said, you just got to kind of overlook some things like that because it's not really talking about the, the reliability of the text. You know what I mean? From their point of view, it did appear as though the sun was moving through the sky and that it stopped. Um, so, 
uh, that's something to consider. Um, it, it works kind of like a message in tongues if you're if you're part of a Pentecostal or charismatic church, where the Holy Spirit will will give a message to a person and it'll guide, but it'll still maintain some of that person's personality. Does that make sense? Now, it's more so, more precise, I guess you could say, with the Bible, though, because God made sure that, that, that things were exactly how, how, what we needed to know. Maybe not, maybe the Bible doesn't have all knowledge and all, you know, uh, because God didn't want us to have all knowledge. He gave us things that were important for us to know. Um, so, uh, but as far as trustworthy, um, the information itself is reliable. The text, um, the text being preserved is reliable. Um, you know, I mean, you had, for instance, the Essene community, you know, who just meticulously copied this stuff, um, and the Jews before them, you know, it's it's been very well preserved. Um, but obviously, this is not a class about textual criticism and that stuff, so we're just going to skip on past that. Um, also, it's authoritative. It is God's word. It is applicable to our lives. It is. It, it has it has bearing over how we do things. It has bearing over how we believe, and it is in fact the world the words of life. Um, in Deuteronomy um, chapter 32 through 47, I'm reading out of the New American Standard. Um, it says there in verse 47, for it is not an idle word for you. Indeed, it is your life. And by this word you will prolong your days in the land which you are about to cross the Jordan to possess. Um, the things, you know, the things that should have been revealed to us are for our knowledge. So it's not a bad thing to study. Um, as far as the texts, I know I just briefly mentioned them. I want to get a little bit more into that now. Um, the scribes carefully copied. I mean, I could talk about how meticulous they were, but just suffice it to say that if you want to know any more about them, I, I, I suggest you look up textual criticism. Um, a very, very as far as we can tell, excellent um, uh, preservation. Now, I do want to approach something. I believe it was Bart Ehrman, uh, don't quote me on that, but I believe it was him, who said that, you know, our manuscripts of, like, the New Testament, I think it was, have so many errors in it that we just, you know, it's just so terrible. But the thing about that is we have so many errors in our manuscripts because we have so many copies, and not all the copies have the error in the same place. So why is it important to find out why, um, you know, why these things uh, figure out what the original manuscript says? Because we only believe that the original manuscript was what was inspired by God. The copies, you know, obviously are going to have some mistakes, you know, from people because people make mistakes. I mean, if you sit a hundred people around a room and have them all copy stuff, uh, the copies are going to be a little bit different. You know, there are going to be differences. So. Um, these scribes developed the vowels. They developed the accents and notes to ensure preservation. The, you know, before Hebrew worked a lot differently, and they, they did these things to help make sure that the text was preserved. Um, so the Old Testament was written in Hebrew and Aramaic, uh, mostly in Hebrew, some parts in Aramaic. Um, we'll talk about that. Uh, the most important one for you, part for you to know is, is um, there's a section in Daniel, um, but we'll get to that when we get to Daniel um, and why it's important. So as far as as far as what we use to translate, I guess uh, what you have is your Old Testament. There's the Masoretic texts, um, which date to about 100 AD. About um, the these things. Remember, dates when you're dating stuff like this is not going to be precise. That doesn't mean exactly 100. Okay, um, and then also th there is you know. There's a lot of stuff at, at stake. You're not just talking about the manuscripts itself. You're talking about the original copy of the manuscript and when that dates from, and then uh, how old your actual manuscript and script is. And, and it, there's just a lot of different stuff to it. Um, once again, if you're interested in that, I suggest you look up textual criticism. Um, then we also have the Samaritan Pentateuch, which once again has the slant on it from the Samaritans. So it's not going to be exactly um, the same as the Jewish. Uh, Pentateuch, which is, remember, the first five books of the Old Testament. Um, <clears throat> but, I mean, it is still a benefit and helps us to relate to the text and to kind of figure stuff out and how they worded stuff. Um, remember, it's always better to have more to base off of when you're translating. Um, so that dates to about 1180. Um, the Dead Sea Scrolls, which date uh, about 100 or 200 or so B.C., um, and the Septuagint, which dates, I mean, as early as 300 BC. Um, uh, oh, a little note on the Septuagint. 
that is the Old Testament in Greek, okay? And um, for reasons which I'm not going to get into, um, it's also called the LXX. Um, so anyways, um, if you see little notes on the bottom of your Bible, it says something like um, LXX reads this. It's talking about the Septuagint, um, which the Septuagint helps us understand Greek a little bit more, helps us understand uh, how things would translate over, that kind of stuff. Um, we also have the Aramaic Targums from about 500 AD. These are less beneficial, but they are still beneficial. Um, and then there's, you know, a lot of other stuff, um, you know, church fathers and, and, and different um, different manuscripts from later on. But these ones are the ones that are really um, of the most uh, importance, especially for uh, preservation and, and translation and that kind of stuff. Um, so I already mentioned this. The Old Testament was the early church's Bible. They didn't have those other books. Um, and then as those books got going, um, it was still a while before the whole church everywhere had what they would call a canon. Okay, um, that was you know after 200 AD. You know after that. So um, you know uh, some areas would 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 circulate certain books, and so like a gospel, for instance, would get associated with a certain area. Um, but anyways, um, so we have, as far as accuracy, we have lots of copies. Um, we have we have good sources who wrote and preserved them, and we have others who quoted them. Um, I mean, really, if you have a high view of Scripture, and when I say high, I mean um, you see it as infallible, as inerrant, that kind of stuff, um, you're going to believe the words of Jesus in Matthew 5, 17 uh, through 19. Do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the, one of, uh, the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Um then obviously you're going to uh, come to the conclusion that the texts have been preserved well and we can trust them. So as far as authorship, um, it, it's a little bit more <laughs> more complicated than that. You have the original writer, then you have a lot of times potentially an editor, and then you have copiers, and then you have translators. So by the time that it gets to your Bible, it's... <laughs> It doesn't have a lot of the subtle little nuances that it originally was written with. So, like, let's say, for instance, Moses wrote the wrote the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. He wrote those five books, okay? Then you have, let's say, Joshua edited them to make sure that, you know, they were complete and to, you know, wrap stuff up and polish them over. And let's say even somebody after Joshua came, like uh, Samuel or something, and, and edited them again. Okay. So you have had three people write five books, Okay. So it's going to have a lot of um, differences, and it's not as simple as who wrote it anymore. It, it, now you've got a whole slew of people involved. And then it was copied. So people are going to, the, the scribes are going to try to preserve it as well as possible, but they are going to make little little different changes here and there to, to correct grammar, to make it uh, more understandable for later generations, that kind of stuff. Um, so now, I mean, God knows how many people you've had, you've had, you know, mess with it. Not to say that it's not reliable, but to say that, to say who wrote this is a little bit mm, vague and oftentimes unknowable. Um, so, um, but uh, once again, if you have a high view of scripture, um, it's just suffice it to say, you know, uh, we have to believe that God, you know, took care of it. Now, I'm not saying faith is blind. Um, sometimes people think that faith is blind, but it's really not. It's just that for the purpose of this class, um, I, I really can't get into that kind of stuff real in depth because, you know, it's just not the place for it. Does that make sense? Um, I hope you don't take offense to that. It's just this is an introduction um, to the Bible, very briefly mentioning stuff. And also this class is just to help people to understand the Bible as a whole. Um, so I really didn't want to take that much time out to talk about that kind of stuff. So the need for a written word. So God creates, you know, people, and but then when when people sinned, it separated them from God. So then man started deciding what was right and wrong, and uh, then as a result of his depraved logic, excuse me, he uh, he created other gods in his mind, like he always does. You know, um, for for right now, technology I say would be America's god. Um, 
you know, everybody is just concerned about social media and their computers and their phones. Excuse me. Um, and so, in a, in a sense, that has become like a god. So now, uh, take away the technology and, and send us back a few thousand years, and well, they created gods instead, like actual, literal gods. Um, and, and so we see the effects of sin, where people don't really think as god-centered as you know, obviously they used to. Um, so then generations go by, and you see this slowly drifting and slowly changing. Um, you know, our, our forefathers, you know, of America, for instance, um, saw things as, you know, hey, we're we have to do these things. We can we can get anything as long as we work hard for it. But now, in, in our generation, it's kind of like, you know, well, not really. You're born with what you got, you know, and sometimes you can work really hard and still not get it, you know. Um, and you just see people, generations, their mindset changes, their worldview changes, how they perceive and understand reality changes. And so we see the same thing happening um, really from the beginning of, of time here. Um, so then man can fellowship with God, and so God revealed of himself to make sure that that, that could happen some more, that, that there could be fellowship between him and his creation. Um, but through all this, the message stayed the same. I want that notice the message stayed the same. So he he made a way for us in the garden. We messed up. Instead of destroying us, which once again remember he, he knew that people were gonna mess up, which is a discussion for a theology lesson. Um, and uh, so he, he, he didn't destroy us, he just punished us. Then he gave us the opportunity to seek after him, which only some did. Um, and then throughout the course of time, um, he revealed of himself in a promise to Abraham, and then he revealed of himself in a covenant with Moses, and then he revealed of himself, you know, in the law to Israel, and then he gave the prophets, and then he gave Jesus, and then he gave the complete of the word that we call the Bible now, plus the Holy Spirit. So obviously, as you can tell, it is easier now to be saved than it ever has been. So. It's only getting easier, too, with the spread of the gospel, the spread of the church. Um, I, I, a few last things need to be mentioned. Is the Bible recording or condoning? Sometimes we see something in the Bible and, and we mistake just because it mentions that that did happen. We think that it's condoning it. Well, no, not necessarily. I'll give you an example. The Bible says in multiple places about how getting drunk, not drinking, but getting drunk, you know, it is basically stupid to do because of all these different things that happens. And so what does it do in Genesis? It shows us accounts of people who got drunk and bad things happened. Noah got drunk. His son sees him and gets cursed. Um, Lot gets drunk and impregnates both of his daughters. See, extremes to show us how something is bad. That makes sense? So as far as is it wrong to drink, well, the Bible doesn't oftentimes doesn't go to extremes in principle. Okay, it doesn't go to the ex let me reword that because I just said that the Bible is about extremes. The Bible does oftentimes doesn't go to extremes in principle because it wants us to understand what he's saying. For instance, the Bible condones being um, um, not following after the lust of the flesh and being where you just put everything in your mouth, you know, but it also doesn't condone not eating at all. That makes sense? Balance. Oftentimes, you know, the Bible teaches balance, but Christians take things to the extremes. So is it wrong for someone to drink? Not in balance. However, we do need to be careful that we don't mislead um, another Christian brother or sister, for instance, who's trying to come out of alcoholism. Because, once again, that is something that, that, that people do struggle with, and we need to be sensitive about that. Um, it's going to be a lot harder for them if they see you, you know, going to the bar or going, you know, uh, buying beer or whatever. And for those of you who want to be contentious about this, just remember, life is not about you. It's about loving God and loving people. So you tell me honestly if you think that you're doing, that you're justifying yourself out of love for your neighbor and for your God, or if you're doing it because you want something. See what I mean? Now, once again, not saying you cannot get drunk. I'm sorry, I'm not saying you cannot drink. Um... I am saying you can get drunk, but uh, don't just don't. I'm not saying uh, about not drinking. Um, just you know, be smart about this. You know, sometimes it's better to give something up so that other another person is better off than it is to enjoy it. So. <clears throat>
Uh, also, whenever the Bible records something in the Old Testament, sometimes it won't even comment on it. It just simply leaves you with the question of what is the result of this happening? Was God's character established in it, or was it against God's character? So, you know, when people start talking about, you know, is it okay to do drugs or whatever, I, I'm pretty sure that the person who honestly says the Bible can come to a pretty good understanding. Like, for instance, the Bible doesn't say anything about marijuana. And the government has, is recently, you know, deciding in different states and whatnot that, that it's, it's okay. Um, well, as me, as a person, as a Christian, I'm not going to do it because I believe that it, that it you know, kind of feeds on the laziness of our hearts. And I believe that it, you know, it's just another thing that it, it, it changes the way you think, regardless of how, how insignificant that might seem. Um, you know, it just obviously has, has effects on our bodies. Um, so as for me, I'm not going to do it, um, and I'm not going to condone other people to do it. Um, I would personally strongly, my view is that Christians should strongly abstain from stuff like that because once again we are being watched, you know, by the world, and they want to see a difference. If we're living the exact same, we can't possibly expect to be a witness. Um, so. Oftentimes, though, in the Old Testament, um, God will do something, and it leaves you with the, wait, God did that? And we try to justify it. No, no, he didn't mean like that. For that, sometimes there's not always easy answers. And all I have to say is this. Let God be God. Let God be God. If that, if the Bible says that's what God, do, and God did, just let it, let it lie there. Sometimes there's not an easy answer. Sometimes you're not going to get the easy answer. You know, sometimes you're not going to understand the answer. So... Um, the Bible definitely doesn't give us full wisdom and understanding. It just, you know, presents us with, with things that, that we need to know. Um, in fact, we'll get to this later, but that's oftentimes the problem with why people, it's not wise to go to Genesis about your beef with the evolution or whatever. So, it is important to notice that the Old Testament ends without the fulfillment of the promise. It happens with parts of it. So Genesis, you know... The fall of man, you know, fall of the dream and everything, and then the rising of one single nation. But then Exodus begins with the, those people in peril. You know, it ends with them in, with them, you know, in, in, in freedom or whatever, and they get the Leviticus and everything seems to be hunky-dory. But then you get to Numbers and, you know, oh, once again, the threat of, of them falling, you know, into, into this place of being unable to be uh, saved. You know, and it just shows us... You know, then they get kicked out of the land later on, and then they get brought back, and you see these partial fulfillments, but you never see the finishing of the story. Um, and that is picked up with the New Testament, which shows us in prophecy the end of the story in the book of Revelation and other books about, you know, Hebrews, for instance, where Jesus wins. Um, so... Um, that's one of the main themes of the, of the Old Testament is you go through this whole thing waiting to see the promise fulfilled and you never see it. So um, that's one of the dramatic things of Numbers, which we'll get into later. Um, we also see that, that ignorance of God's ways is not – it's not an excuse. Um, you know, Paul talks about this with, with, um, with uh, people having no excuse as far as um, – um, you know, their conscience bears, bears witness and that kind of stuff, and nature bears witness. Um, and you see God giving people patience and, um, you know, constantly showing them love and then just continually turning their back. God says to, I think it's Abraham, he says, you know, the iniquity of the Malachites is not yet fulfilled. Basically, um, I'm still giving the Malachites a little bit more time to repent. Jonah goes to Nineveh. Um, for the Assyrians to um, basically give them a second chance, you know, and then and they listen, you know. Um, people originally walked with God, and then they got so this the effects of sin just, throughout the generations. We didn't tell our kids, you know, and we just kept drifting into our own selfishness into what we wanted in life. And as a result, you have people get, getting further and further away and then blaming it on God. Well, once again, God didn't make those decision, decisions. You know, we made those decisions. People made, made – and you know that we did because we still are making those decisions. You know, uh, we always choose ourselves over, over anyone, really. What's America's motto, you know? Hey, watch out for number one because nobody else is going to do it. Whereas God says, you know, 
um, watch out for number two because nobody else is going to watch out for them. Um, so anyways, um, and, we, and we see, you know, um, Israel oftentimes even justifying um, what, they, what they're doing, you know, oh, God won't really do that or whatever. And um, just showing that, the, the, you know, the ignorance of God's ways doesn't mean that God's not doesn't mean that God's not moving. Um, just because you don't see how God's moving does not mean that God is not moving. God is still active. He's still working in our lives, um, even when we can't see him. Um, so that's the end of this lesson. Um, next lesson, we'll be talking about the land and the people. Um, and I believe that's the last of the introduction um, lessons, uh, and then we'll start getting to actual content. Um, I hope you enjoyed this. Um, this will be going on for, for quite a few weeks. So, uh, God bless.